Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. I'm Rebecca Power, Interim Director of the North Central Region Water Network and your host for this webinar. Uh, can everyone hear me? And if you, if you can, uh, you could just use one of your, yep, there you go. Everybody's finding the yes check marks in their, uh, in Blackboard Collaborate. Got a couple check marks. Great. Super. Um, the purpose of the current is to increase your access to excellent extension programming and research that may be useful to you in your own work. Uh, we certainly hope that it will be. The format uh, for the current is four 10-minute presentations with questions and discussion at the end. Uh, all the webinars are archived on the North Central Region Water Network website for your future viewing pleasure. And the URL for that website is northcentralwater.org. Our topic for the day is soil health. What do we know and what can we do? And as you all know, soil health has been a hot topic lately. So we've got uh, five presenters that will uh, give us a bit more information about what they are doing in soil health and um, the latest research and extension programming uh, in the North Central region. Uh, this webinar is the fourth in our series, and, and the fifth one will be taking place on October 15th. And, and these webinars are always at 2 p.m. Central Time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for those of you that are in the, the Eastern Time Zone. Uh, and the topic for the uh, October webinar is Aquatic Invasive Species Impacts and Resources. I'm going to back up a slide here. Uh, we've got a few tips here for a good experience, um, both for our presenters and for people that are listening in. Um, use, please use a headset if you can. Uh, be sure to run through the audio setup wizard. Um, this, of course, for those of you that are just going to be listening, isn't as important. But if you're going to be asking questions at the end uh, using audio, it's helpful to ha run through the audio setup wizard. Please submit questions for the presenters via the chat box. That chat box is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and, and after our, our presentations, we'll have a dedicated question and answer session at the end. So we're going to be collecting all the questions during the presentations and uh, sorting through those and um, presenting those to speakers at the end. OK, and to our next slide, uh, today's presentations will be by Naeem Calver of North Dakota State University, Dave Franzen, also from North Dakota State, Chris Augustin, uh, who I think was having uh, a few problems getting into the site. So while we still hope to have Chris, uh, we may move uh, his presentation toward the end. And then finally, Kevin Erb from UW Extension and Christina Curell from Michigan State University. So we're going to get some great information from our neighbors to the north, North Dakota State, and uh, supplement that with uh, uh, Kevin and Christina's uh, presentations. All right, that said, why don't we get started? And we'll uh, begin with Naeem. Naeem is an extensionary specialist for soil health for North Dakota State University out of the Langdon Research Extension Center. He's been working to prevent and mitigate soil salinity and sedicity through applied research and demonstration plots along with his North Dakota State University soil health team. With a soil health group uh, comprising North Dakota State University and, extension and external educators, he developed and delivers extension educational programs for soil health for stakeholders. Recently, the group installed a groundwater management project by generating $80,000 through outside sponsors. And with this project in place, the group will be able to conduct research on soil salinity and sodicity, groundwater management, and screening of water use efficiency and salt tolerant crops in order to find practical solutions for the producers of North Dakota. So welcome, Neem, and take it away. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, can you all hear me clearly? Naeem, we're not able to hear you. Uh, can you all hear me now? Uh, I can just barely hear your voice. Uh, you can barely hear my voice. Okay. Um, 
club on now. Um, uh, can you hear me now or? No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask Janice to work with you on the sound uh, and you can run through your audio setup wizard again and we're going to move on to Dave Franzen's presentation. Okay. Okay. So Dave, can you can we hear you if you just want to test your mic for a second? Yeah, I'm on. Perfect. All right, so I will run through your introduction. Dave Franzen uh, received all three of his degrees from the University of Illinois. He's a professor of soil science uh, uh, at North Dakota State and a North Dakota State Extension Soil Specialist since 1994. He researches sampling methods for site-specific nutrient management and is responsible for revising and updating nutrient management recommendations for 20 major crops within North Dakota. He also researches nitrogen management strategies and I'll let you all looking at the screen read through those various strategies that he specializes in uh, as well as micronutrients for crops in North Dakota. He makes many extension presentations to many uh, farmers, ag professionals, uh, and others each year and has received several professional awards, which again you can also read there. So obviously Dave is a, a busy person and has a, a lot to offer uh, both North Dakota and the North Central region. And thanks so much for joining us, Dave. Okay, thanks very much. So my charge today is to visit about soil erosion effects. And I put productivity, but soil health productivity often go hand in hand. So we'll just, uh, we'll just use the two interchangeably. So let's see, do I have the control for this thing? I believe you should. I'm I believe you should, and, and if you don't, let me know. Okay, and let me see. I think it's, is it those arrows up on top? Oh, it's these arrows here. Okay, all right, good enough. All right, I got it down. So if you go to a presentation about soil erosion, uh, growers oftentimes will roll their eyes and yawn or look at their cell phone and save the soil, blah, 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 is all they hear. And, and I think many of them are so far removed from maybe some events that happened in the past that they really don't understand what we're talking about when we're, we're talking about uh, the soil conservation issue. They think it's an old topic and it's not really relevant. But 80 years ago, save the soil was a a critical phrase that uh, helped keep many people in the U.S. and other places around the world from starvation. This is a picture from Western North Dakota in the early 1930s. It was a devastating event. So one of the things that led to it was um, was some intensive tillage. This is uh, the Red River Valley, as many of you have uh, maybe visited or drove by or have heard about it, but it's a big lake bed extending from south of Fargo about 50 miles all the way to Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba. Uh, and it was a big agricultural area and always has been. And uh, this is a scene from around 1910, roughly, and you can't see a, sea, a tree anywhere in sight, not a single tree. So all of that was OK. They had occasional dust storms, but nobody really gave it any thought. There were deep black soils. Uh, and, uh, and they had periodic rainfall and the yields were pretty decent and then it uh, became dry and then the wind blew and uh, it drove a lot of people out all across the Great Plains. Certainly North Dakota was part of that. These are, these are dunes that uh, almost cover a barn uh, just east of Bismarck uh, and uh, this is in 1939 at the very end of the Dust Bowl and so you can imagine all the soil that was lost during that period of time. So it was a, it was a huge deal. The, uh, this didn't turn out real well, but this is a news clipping from Bismarck in the, in the mid-30s. And uh, the point I wanted to make with this is that there were reports at that time of the dust clouds extending up into the atmosphere 14,000 feet. A lot of people think that dust storms are just along the ground. They fill up the ditch. You put the soil that's in the ditch back in the field and everything's fine. But but dust storms are a three-dimensional beast, and now with satellite images, we can see them from space. This is satellite image not too many years ago, just a few years ago from the Palouse uh, area. The scale down here is uh, 25 kilometers, which is about 15 miles. So distance from here to 15 miles 
it would take a heck of a ditch to catch all that soil. So these things are three-dimensional and they carry soil many, many miles. So the only soil that go, well, ends up in the ditch is the heavy stuff, but all of the great nutrient-loaded uh, material, the, the material with lots of organic matter and active uh, biology has is, is gone away somewhere else. In the 1930s, uh, in the late 1930s assessment, uh, over a half million uh, acres had serious erosion and really needed intensive care in order to continue production. And almost 10 million acres were so severely eroded that their range to this day that uh, probably before the 30s we had over 30 million acres of cropland and now uh, we have at most somewhere around 24 million, something like that. So, so we lost a lot of acres of productive cropland simply because it was destroyed during the 30s. So one of the things that affects the soil health, of course, you know, we, you know, it's not like, let me see, we want to save the soil just to make sure that everything's pristine like it used to be. But there's there's reasons for having their topsoil there. Before the prairies are plowed, of course, the, these nutrients had accumulated for thousands of years. The plants, the grasses, and the forbs that grew there gathered nutrients from deep in the deep in the soil, transformed uh, rock-type forms of nutrients into nutrients that plants could use, uh, and lifted that up to the toward the soil surface and uh, accumulated that organic material with a huge diversity of biology uh, and uh, and then as soon as the land was plowed and that it, we had that natural bank of thousands of years of soil plant and microbial activity and all the nutrients that have been mobilized through all those years. When North Dakota was first plowed up back in around 1900 or so, the initial wheat yields from that era were 40 bushels an acre. This is, this is hand sowing with crop varieties that were brought from everywhere on the planet. Uh, the farming methods were poor, and they still uh, were able to achieve 40 bushels an acre, which is pretty close to the state average in many years here in North Dakota today. So there had to have been a lot of nitrogen and phosphate that was available at this time to support these kind of yields. And when we leave a, a, a piece of land bare, uh, fallow in North Dakota today, we really don't uh, mobilize enough nitrogen and phosphate to make those yields possible without supplementing them in some way. Back in the 30s, the dust was so thick uh, in the east that uh, in New York City, you could go out in Central Park uh, after a Great Plains dust storm and pick up dust by the spoonful. And scientists did this, and they found that that, that soil contained 19 times more phosphate than in the soil that was left behind, 10 times more organic matter, 9 times more nitrogen, 45 times more potassium. So a huge amount of fertilizer nutrients, not alone uh, the, the bacterial and microbial populations were all lost during that period of time. These white boxes here on this chart, uh, those represent the North Dakota wheat yields from back around 1890. These are equivalent to around 40 bushel yields here. We didn't achieve those kind of yields again until the mid-1950s with the advent of commercial fertilizer. The, the production dropped to about half, uh, even in the more moist years uh, toward 1940 or so. Uh, and uh, it, we, we just lost a lot of productivity. So the soil health had been ruined on a lot of these fields, and the productivity suffered greatly. So the estimates, if we estimate how much phosphate just uh, pick out one nutrient was lost during the 30s, uh, it would be around eight, 8 million tons from North Dakota. And that would represent 40 years of phosphate application using present rates, which are historically high. So it was just huge, the amount of nutrients we lost. So, so you would think that today that we have all the problems solved. And in some parts of the state, we do. During the 70s, uh, late 70s, farmers took it on their own, especially in the western part of the state, in order to organize uh, groups that would work together to work out no-till systems, and eventually an extension got on board. And so a lot of the western North Dakota is, is no-till today. But that's not true in the Red River Valley, where the darker soil fools people that were not experiencing losses. But as you see in this image from northern part of the Red River Valley here just a few years ago, we still get dust storms today, sometimes significantly so. This is a road ditch that's pretty much full of soil uh, from one of those events. It doesn't take 
but one or two events a year to lose a lot of soil. This isn't an everyday occurrence, but it happens from time to time. So why aren't farmers more concerned about it? And I think what that is is that they hide the effects with tillage. Over here on the left-hand side, maybe here's a pristine prairie profile with a thick black A horizon and a, and a B horizon, which maybe has an accumulation of clay or some other minerals, and then the, the subsoil underneath. So, so you lose maybe a half inch, an inch of soil, maybe more than that, maybe less than that. But over a period of time, you get to the point where when you when a farmer works the field, say, 8, 10 inches deep, maybe deeper, that some of the bee begins to be incorporated into this top zone. And so it still looks black to them, but what they're doing is they're diluting this rich area, which they've lost a lot of, uh, with this lower area. It still looks black to them, but they're decreasing the productivity and soil health of the soil. And, they, and they, many of them get to the point where they still have a black layer up on top, so it still looks fine to them but they've completely lost the B horizon and uh, whatever is left of it has been mixed in with whatever is left in the A horizon and they're now incorporating uh, subsoil into their into their topsoil. So this is a this is a uh, uh, a soil from up near Grand Forks and uh, all of this didn't come through but uh, the reason I put this up here is this this profile was a was characterized in the early 1960s by NRCS, and the subsoil here uh, was around 39 inches. So it had a nice A horizon, had a nice developed B, and then the C horizon was 39 inches, somewhere around in here. So in uh, just last year, in 2014, uh, a team of uh, researchers at NDSU went back to the same site, and what they found is that the, the measurement from the top of the soil to where the subsoil starts is only 15 inches. So during that period of time of about 50 years from 1960 to 2014, they lost 15 inches of topsoil. So the bee was completely gone. It was just mixed in here with whatever sea horizon is there. So see, farmers don't understand because they just see this thing and, 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 that, and that's all they see. They don't think they're losing any. But with some investigation, what you have, uh, uh, if you look down into the soil, oftentimes you'll see old root channels or, uh, or uh, mole burrows or, or uh, ground squirrel burrows, and that, and that organic matter that filled that up many, many years ago is very, very black. So look at the blackness of this organic matter that used to be here compared to what's left in the soil. If you look at that, you see how much we've lost over time. So if we look at what we've lost in the state for since 1940, uh, we've lost another 5 million tons of phosphate uh, and a significant amount of nitrogen from that topsoil loss, which is another 30 years of nitrogen and phosphate loss at our present rates. So farmers say, well, you know, I don't really think that really matters too much because our, our yields have increased in corn, our yields have increased in wheat over the years, and that's true. But but one has to wonder what the yields would have really been like if we would have been able to tap into that, that topsoil. So, so here's maybe the gains over time that we've made over the past 40 years or so. But if we would have had that soil productivity, that soil health, that, uh, that topsoil that we, we lost uh, had, uh, that maybe our increase would be like this and the yield differences would be great. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, uh, it looks like Naeem is ready to go, so we're going to um, reverse course here and pick him back up. Give me one second to back through these slides here. There we are. Okay. Um, so can you guys hear me now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. So Go thanks ahead. Back. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Naeem Kalvar, and I'm part of NDSU Soil Health Team, and all we are six uh, team members. Uh, two of us are based in Fargo, whereas four of us work uh, from different um, research extension centers. And myself, I'm uh, based at Langdon REC. My topic is soil salinity and soda city and their impacts to soil health. These two are the two major soil health concerns our producers are facing um, right now. 
Um, Rebecca, I don't have the option to change the slides. Can you please give it to me? OK. Um, when, we, when we see a barren piece of ground um, with a white surface uh, salt crust um, on it, um, often we think about excessive salts, uh, which is true. However, there may be another problem which is related to excessive sodium or soil sodicity, which may be um, there along with the excessive salt issues. Um, unlike uh, salts, there are no clear visual symptoms of soil sodicity at the surface. And the best way to estimate is to take a soil sample, send it to lab, and test it for not only just the salts, but for the sodium too. These two are slightly different problems, um, salt as well as sodium. And when it comes to the management of both, um, the remediation of um, soil sodicity require one extra step. Uh, can we please move to the next slide? Um, saline soils will have a um, high amount of water-soluble salts. And in order to check that, we analyze the soil samples for electrical conductivity. Uh, the most common salts in North Dakota are sulfate-based salts of calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Uh, soils of northern Red River Valley are high for chloride-based salts. And uh, normally, um, Coarser soils are high for sodium carbonate. As per a study done in 2010, there were about 5.8 million acres of um, saline uh, soil salinity in our state. And that's an old number. We assumed that the number would be quite high at this point in time. I was just going through um, another old uh, book. And that book reported that there were about 2 million acres affected by soil sodicity in 1974. So there are some numbers, but we don't have any recent number in terms of soil sodicity. Uh, can we please move to the next one? The major in fact, excessive water-soluble salts will have on plant growth is that they won't let the plant roots uptake the water, even under uh, wet soil conditions. And the result would be drought-distressed plants. Under severe conditions, uh, plants will die. Uh, next, please. Salts, however, especially the calcium-based salts, uh, keep the um, soil in flocculated condition. That means there would be very good soil structure. And that will facilitate uh, the movement of soil water as well as air within the soil pores. Next, please. Uh, soil sodicity happens when excessive sodium ions get absorbed or attracted to the soil cation exchange sites, or the negative sites, uh, which are mainly provided by clay particles um, or the humus fraction of the soil. So once this um, sodium gets attached to clay particle, it leads to the formation of sodium plus clay. And normally, this clay is part of a larger soil aggregate. Uh, can we move to the next one, please? So once this sodium plus clay is formed, that weakens the forces which hold these clay particles um, with the larger soil aggregates. And the sodium plus clay then disperses from the larger aggregates, and it forms dense layers. Um, the way to analyze soils for soil sodicity is to either uh, check the samples for a sodium absorption ratio or exchangeable sodium percentage. They both will tell us whether we have soil sodicity issue or no. Next, please. Once that happens, um, the soils will, um, soil particles, especially clay, will disperse from the larger soil aggregates, and the soils would be um, in the shape of dense layers. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Rebecca, next slide, please. Yep, I, you, sh you should have your next slide up. Rebecca? C can you hear me? Naeem, your next slide should be up. 
go ahead and talk name. It is showing up on ours, so it may be a few minutes until it shows up on yours. We're uh, seeing are, inoculated, dispersed sorry. ones. Are, are you guys with me? Can, can We're you showing the inoculated and dispersed. OK. Yeah, I can hear you now. So once, once um, yep. Yep. Yes. I, 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 yeah, I could see that. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Um, so um, once soil dispersion happens, it it, it destroys uh, the soil structure. And, and this is kind of a more severe problem than the excessive salt issue. It greatly reduces the soil pore space, which will lead to low soil oxygen and then low microbial activity. Um, there would be surface crusting, soils which will be difficult to till. There would be poor seed germination, restricted root growth. These soils would be always saturated with the water. And there would be a great potential for wind and water erosion. Uh, next, please. Can we, can we go to the, um, yeah, the main, main cause, can we go one more, please? The main cause for these excessive salts as well as sodium is the parent material of these soils along with the underlying sodium rich shell um, in our state. Um, can we go one more, please? And the main carrier for bringing these excessive salts are sodium um, within the plant root zone or at the surface is the groundwater, either in shape of uh, high water table level or the capillary rise of soil water. Water eventually evaporates and the salts remain at the surface. Can we go one more, please? When it comes to the management, uh, the first step is to analyze the soils for soil EC or electrical conductivity, sodium absorption ratio, and soil pH. That is very important because we have to know how high the salt or the sodium levels are. We also need to intercept the sources of excess water from the adjoining fields, for example, because that will lead to higher water table depth, more capillary rise of soil water. We also lower down a water table uh, depth because uh, salts can only leach down into the soil. Uh, we could do that by planting water to use efficient crops like alfalfa, alpha or by installing a subsurface drainage system. It is also important to improve the soil water infiltration by improving uh, soil structure. We could add livestock manure. We could add more plant residues. Uh, we could go for conservation tillage, anything which will promote better soil particle aggregation uh, to improve soil structure. In terms of um, soil sodicity, we have to have another extra step. And that would require the application of calcium supplements. And calcium will then go and displace the sodium from the soil exchange sites and sodium will get converted into a salt. And once it, it becomes a salt, it can leach out of the plant root zone. It's also important to start with a salt tolerant crop or a grass to establish a cover. Leaving the saline or sodic soils bare will lead to more evaporation. And that means more capillary rise. So it'll make the problem worse. Uh, next, please. Then we add the calcium supplements into the soil. It is also very important to mix them thoroughly into the soil um, in order for that chemical reaction to take place. Uh, so these, these supplements should come directly in contact with the soil particles. Uh, and for that, we have to mix them properly. One more, please. If you just focus on the bottom at the bottom of the slide, uh, that shows the chemical reaction. So for example, if we add calcium supplement, like for example, gypsum, uh, the sodium is attached to the soil exchange site or the colloids. 
And when you apply gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, calcium displaces the sodium from the particles, and sodium gets converted into sodium sulfate, which is a salt. So that is leachable. So that's how this chemical reaction takes place. And this is just an example for calcium sulfate gypsum. There are some other amendments like uh, calcium carbonate or lime, sulfuric acid. Depending upon the soil type situation and economics, uh, one can use um, other type of amendments too. One thing uh, I would like to Thank end very, very uh, much, name. this very talk interesting. with Thanks a note that everybody uh, for your even though these are both a few, problems, um, so the issues, and sodicity are severe, there. It looks but like sodicity can be more time consuming so we will and move on now to, to Chris Augustine. Uh, I would end and uh, like with that. Janice is going to help me there, I think. Can you guys hear me fine? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, we're getting to your slides. And while we're doing that, I will do your introduction. So Chris grew up on his family farm in northeastern North Dakota near the town of Crystal. Helping out the small grains, sugar beets, and potatoes operation gave Chris a love of agriculture and a respect for the land. During the spring of 2008, Chris began to work for the North Dakota State University Extension Service as a nutrient management specialist, where he worked with farmers and ranchers' fertility programs and consulted with them uh, on environmental issues. Chris has been an area extension specialist uh, in, in soil health at North Central Research Extension Center since 2012. He helps farmers improve their soil resources, and he is excited to improve North Dakota soil by educating producers, technical service providers, and others on current and emerging soil management practices. So thanks so much for joining us, Chris. And um, can you see your um, buttons there on the uh, top right? Yes, I slide? can, and I can flip them forward and backwards. <laughs> Excellent. Right. OK, go right ahead. All right, thank you, Rebecca. So I'm going to talk about cover crops and how they can be used for managing water as well as salinity. So we have a bunch of spots in our state that look like this. And the name said we have about 5.8 million acres of our state that is adversely affected by soil salinity. And that's roughly about the size of Vermont. So that's a good chunk of our state. And when it comes to managing these saline areas, it comes down to managing the water. And one of the things that we have available um, from NDSU is Endon. That's the North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network. And so they got these weather stations set up. Uh, I think every county has one, and there's a number of counties that have two or three. And there's this cool little tool that it has. If you look at the bottom of the slide, I have that link there that estimates crop water use. So I'm going to talk about crop water use with full season cover crops as well as late season cover crops. So last year in rugby, uh, which is pretty close to the center of the state, they had about 20 inches of rainfall. And if you look at the other uh, crops grown there, that says what their water use is between the 1st of May and the 15th of October last year. And maybe these numbers are a little early. We had a pretty late winter uh, in 2013. And alfalfa is one of those king uh, water users in our state. It'll use about 24 inches in 2013, followed by sugar beets, about 21 inches, corn, 18 and a half, turf grass, 18, soybeans, 17 inches, potatoes, 16, sunflowers, 15 and a half, dry beans, 14.4 uh, inches, wheat, about 14 and a quarter inches, and barley, uh, just shy of 13 inches. So in the red, I, below those, I, I, I'm showing the deficit. So that's for drying down the soil and not going into the next growing season with excess water. And in the instance of last year, alfalfa and sugar beets were um, two things that could have been grown in the rugby area that would have uh, reduced the amount of soil water. So this is some work done by Jim Sterica. He's a soil scientist over at the Williston Research Extension Center, which is uh, just about on the Montana border uh, along Highway 2. It's about two hours west of Minot. So it's a pretty arid, one of our more arid regions in North Dakota. And he was looking at uh, crop water use between spring wheat, uh, various cover crops, as well as fallowed ground. And my understanding with the fallowed ground was as soon as uh, 
uh, a weed or something started growing, they went out and tilled it. So they uh, kept the ground pretty black between the 17th of June and the 12th of August. And so in, during that time, uh, spring wheat would have used a little over four inches. The average use of cover crop water was uh, 2.1 inches, and the tilled fallow would have only dried the soil down about six tenths. And um, this didn't account for the added precipitation, which during the, this time was about three and a quarter inches. Um, the reason why I show this is I've had several discussions with farmers where they use tillage to manage the water to dry out the soil. And um, back in the 80s and earlier, we used to do a lot of, a lot of summer fallowing in our state. And uh, a lot of our farmers have forgotten why we did summer fallow back then to conserve water. So looking at a timeline of fallow versus crop water use, this is again over in Williston, um, soil water content seems to be pretty close to the same until we start getting to the middle of June. Then the crop water or, or the soil water content in the crop really starts falling down. That's because uh, the crops really start growing and they start utilizing that water, whereas in that fallowed system, it's preserved. And so that, that average water use of cover crops is 2.1 inches. These are the different mixes of cover crops that they had in those plots, as well as their cost. Now, the barley and lentils used about 3.5 inches of water. Uh, the peas, oats, and safflower, 2.5 inches. Barley, peas, turnip, radishes, about 2.1 inches. The soybeans, oats, millet, and sunflower, they used about 3.3 .3 inches. Uh, the egg is blend, which I, I don't know what was actually in that uh, blend. They used about an inch and a half. Uh, the Pulse USA used uh, about 2.2 .2 inches. The Pulse USA Early Nitrogen Builder used about two and a half inches. Uh, the small seeded uh, mix from Pulse USA used about 2.1 inches. The Early Grazer used about an inch and a half. And uh, the Preventive Plant water use from Pulse USA used about 2.1 inches. So there, there's a lot of difference between uh, one mix versus the next, and that can have a great effect on how much water is being used during that growing season. So I get a lot of questions uh, from farmers, how, what should I put in for cover crops? And these are some common questions that I ask them, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to have something for erosion control, which anything growing out in that field is going to help reduce erosion? What about water management? I'll cover some of those high water use crops in a little bit. Uh, what about nitrogen? Uh, if you're talking a, a late season cover crop up in North Dakota, you're probably not going to get um, much of a nitrogen uh, boost from your legumes. What about organic matter? For that, you want to have uh, cover crops that have a lot of carbon in it. Uh, if you have some compaction issues, maybe looking at some tap roots, radishes, beets, that might be w worth looking into. What about cost? Um, a couple slides earlier, I showed the cost of different mixes, and a lot of times with farmers, they have uh, old stuff sitting in the bin, and uh, some of them are putting that old stuff back out on the soil just to have something growing there. What about salinity? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Time of year, late full season cover crops? Are you going to turn cattle loose on it? What about your rotations? Could there be an herbicide issue? And what about the cocktails, the different mixes that we see with uh, cover crops? One of the things that we do see um, with those brassica cover crops, because they don't have the micro, they, they don't have those mycorrhizae associations, uh, we have seen some phosphorus issues the next growing season if a farmer just uses um, something like radishes and turnips, whereas if you had a mix with some rye, barley, something else in there that has those mycorrhizae associations, um, they usually don't have an issue with phosphorus the following growing season. And the other thing I like to talk about too is root architectures and mining or managing that entire soil profile, not just those top six inches, but having things going down three or four feet, looking at tap roots, looking at fibrous roots, and their different rooting depths. Now, one thing that's 
one tool that that's pretty neat that I found is uh, this cover crops chart put out by the Mandan ARS. Um, if you look on the screen, I have uh, different crops circled in yellow and different crops circled in red. Um, the ones in yellow, those are the more salt tolerant uh, cover crops. So that would be barley, ryegrass, wheat, beets, sunflowers. And the ones in red are more high water use, cereal rye, triticale, mustard, carrots, beets, radishes, turnips, sanfoin, alfalfa, sunflower, safflower, and corn. Um, another great place to find information on, on these, these more saline tolerant uh, forages is uh, a publication put out by uh, the USDA NRCS Plant Material Cent Center uh, done by this uh, Tober and others. And some of the more salt tolerant forages that we have available are beardless wild rye, and that does okay in wet sites. And usually in these more saline areas, because the salts are moving with the water, there's higher water content in there as well. Uh, tall wheatgrass does okay. So does Russian wild rye. Uh, the new high hybrid wheatgrass does pretty well. Slender wheatgrass, Altai wild rye. Tall fescue uh, is good in wet areas. So is western wheatgrass and strawberry clover. And one of the things when managing these saline areas or wet areas is to think about the landscapes. Where's the water coming from? Where's the water going? Um, that tractor down there, I'm trying to uh, cover everybody. They're, they're, all tractors can get stuck at some time or another. That's why that one's green, red, blue, and yellow. Um, so as water infiltrates into the soil, it can uh, hit an impermeable layer. And due to that capillary rise, will come back up at the base of a hill. But then you also have runoff that uh, accumulates the water down there. So where the water accumulates, that's where the salts will accumulate. Now, North Dakota has uh, a very wide difference in precipitation from the west end of the state to the east end of the state. And one of the things that I've seen over my years in mine it is if you're on the eastern end of the state, they usually have enough precipitation in September and August where a lot of the times a late season cover crop following uh, a wheat harvest, a canola harvest, something early in the year, your late season cover crops can work. Um, in that intermediate area, sometimes it can, sometimes it, it won't, depends upon the year. And over in the western end of the state, where it has a tendency to get pretty dry in August and September, those late season cover crops sometimes uh, don't work just because of the lack of moisture. So when looking at a saline area, um, you have the white spot that can have a lot of salt in it. And as you get further away, the salt levels have a tendency to decrease. So in those really white areas uh, where I'm working with farmers, I'm trying to get them to uh, plant those more salt tolerant forages, that new high, the tall wheatgrass, the western wheatgrass, things like that that will take a, a lot of salt. And then you move out a little bit. Alfalfa is a great thing to plant as a barrier because that can uh, prevent that lateral movement of the water and kind of act as a dam and hold the salts at bay. And then when you get outside of that, um, planting your normal cropping systems can work. And if you can get some cover crops out there later in the fall or, or post-harvest, um, th there's a good option to help manage, manage those saline sites in those areas. Now, in the western end of the state, uh, where it does get pretty dry in August and September, some of the guys that are starting to look at cover crops are more addressing just the wet areas and being more site specific with their cover crops where you have these wet areas in the green post harvest they would plant the cover crops only in those areas and leave the rest of it stubble um, just because where where those wet areas are not um, the cover crops usually have an issue germinating and 
when you're in those wetter areas, more times than not, they, they have a tendency to germinate and do pretty good. So that brings us back to the, um, the crop water use calculator put together by Endon. So the, this is what I call late season cover crop water use. We're estimating the 5th of August is an emergence date. Uh, with the 15th of October being the, um, the day that the plants die. Uh, in some instances, we could have a frost beforehand that could kill off some of uh, the plant, more susceptible frost plants, such as the corn or the soybeans. Um, but if we were to plant on the 5th of August, uh, sugar beets would use almost five inches of rain. So would the corn, the soybeans would. Sunflowers would use about six and a half inches of rain dry beans about 6.3, wheat uh, 6.7 inches, and barley would use the most at about 7 inches of uh, precipitation. Chris. And when we get to those sunflowers. Yep, you'll yes. need to finish up in the next 30 seconds or so. Oh, okay. So anyways, um, if we have winter wheat, that's going to use about 14 inches of water. Um, rainfall would be 20 inches, so we have an excess of 5 inches. But if we follow that winter wheat as uh, sunflowers for a cover crop, we'd end up drying down the soil. And those water uses go down drastically uh, when we plant them later in the season. Um, still though, barley, wheat, those cool season uh, grasses have a tendency to use more water than anything else. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Great, thanks, Chris. We'll hold questions. Um, I know we're we're running out of time for questions, but we'll get Kevin and Christina started quickly. So Kevin Erb is the Conservation Professional Development and Training Coordinator for the University of Wisconsin Extension. He's based in Green Bay. Um, as soon as we get his information up here, you can read that for yourself. Under his leadership, whoa. Um, under his leadership. The Conservation Professional Training Program has developed a suite of more than 40 training courses for public and private sector conservation advisors over the past 12 years, including a series on soil health training. Uh, Kevin is also a certified crop advisor. And then Christina Curell has worked for Michigan State University Extension for 17 years as a water quality educator. And her role is primarily assisting growers on farm and um, on ways to minimize their farming practices risk to water quality while ensuring the farm is sustainable and profitable. She's also worked uh, with conservation districts and NRCS to train their staff on various water quality and water quality topics. So Kevin and Christina, take it away. Thank you very much, Rebecca. What I want to do is kind of go through quickly some of the training that uh, we've developed here as a multi-state effort and then let Christina talk some about some of the efforts here in Michigan as well. So I'll try to get through this here in fairly rapid order. But from a soil health perspective, we've really been looking at this as a way to help farmers adapt to and mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. We know we've seen much more intense rainfall events occurring across the upper Midwest with greater frequency, and we believe from a resource management perspective that improving soil health is one way to deal with those by not only increasing infiltration, but also by nutrient holding and uh, managing soil water. So we've really looked at this from a multi-state approach because it really eliminates duplication of effort. There's a huge amount of talk and discussion out there about soil health. We believe a lot of duplication of effort, and if we can just draw on the best of what everybody else is doing, we're going to be much more productive in the long run and build on each other's strengths and infrastructure. And we know that such multi-state approaches have really worked well in the past. So I want to talk a little bit about the multi-state approach that uh, we've taken over the past couple of years here. And it was a uh, three-state project that involved Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. And I saw Paul Hay uh, was on the conference here as well. He was one of our partners. But each of the three states, and it was funded by a combination of the Great Lakes Regional Water Quality Program and the Heartland Program, um, 
looked at a different target audience, developed materials that we've shared back and forth. And so Michigan really focused on outreach to the certified crop advisors, the consultants, and did a day-long uh, sub-conference as part of the Michigan Egg Business Association conference that was incredibly well received. Here in Wisconsin, we focused on working with NRCS and developed a Train the Trainer course uh, that focused on their employees. And in Nebraska, Paul focused on integrating soil health into some of the no-till farmer workshops that he was involved in. So here in Wisconsin, we developed a train the trainer curriculum because we knew that we don't have the resources to do all the field days, but if we can really empower our soil and water district staff, our NRCS staff, and others out there, that's where the biggest bang for the buck is going to be. We developed a classroom session followed by a field that's now been converted to an online course along with a field component. We've developed a series of advanced online courses in soil health, soil water management, cover crops, and soil health management systems. And we've developed a regional simple to use toolkit out there that uh, farmers uh, can be used, can be used with farmers by agency staff and private consultants really to drive home the points of soil health. So what we wanted to do was empower the agency staff and our private TSPs and partners with the technical knowledge to go forward to give them the hands-on abilities, but we also integrated into it an evaluation approach as well. And so as I said before, we've got that introduction course that's now available online. We have the three advanced technical courses that are online with a field component as well. The final thing that we really felt was important here in Wisconsin and in the multi-state partnership was a soil health kit that really put simple tools in the hands of those who are trained. We integrated instantaneous and follow-up evaluation methodologies, so we would survey the farmer right afterward, but then do a follow-up. And we set a target goal of $300 or less to put the kits together. Here's a quick photo of what the uh, two-part kit looks like. We've got the duffel bag and our infamous five-gallon bucket and our soil compaction probe made from spare parts from a uh, hardware store. Here's uh, just a view of what's in there. There's a number of different uh, tests, a slate test, uh, a number of simple soil chemistry tests that can be done as well. And uh, it has worked very, very well for us in the field. The private sector side, um, Michigan obviously really did some targeting there. We have integrated the private sector fairly extensively into the development of the Wisconsin courses. They've served as course advisors and helped us develop the team. And we're now in the middle of an industry outreach that will uh, take soil health training to one of the major seed corn producing companies in the Midwest with training being launched in Iowa and Michigan as a pilot here within the next month and a half or so. So with that, I want to turn it over to Christina to talk about what's going on in Michigan and her perspective here Thank as you, well. Thank you, Kevin. Can everyone hear me? Take that as a yes. Um, one of the things that we knew, noticed in Michigan is why we had a lot of people that were that were jumping on the soil health bandwagon. And some of our agribusiness wasn't there with us. So what we decided to do is to, to to do some concentrated efforts on teaching them. And we approached our MAB, our Michigan Agribusiness Association, and they allowed us to come and speak into their major event for the year. And they bring most, every, most all agribusinesses from the state will come for three days. They meet in Lansing. And we uh, were asked, and we asked them, and they allowed us to come and speak to them. And what we looked at is we looked at various things that deals with soil. And one of the things we looked at is what is soil quality? We noticed that there was a definite difference between what soil quality and what soil health meant when we talked to different growers in the agribusiness. So what we did is we, we tried to coordinate and come up with a concise a definition that would work in Michigan on what soil quality was. And we used Dr. Harwood uh, as his, we used his example. And we kind of um, have stemmed all of our programmings from that. So we talked to, with this group about what soil quality is. And then along with that, we also looked at tillage. Um, Paul Gross, who is another extension uh, colleague of mine, uh, 
deals a lot with, with the tillage aspects of human and he uh, talked to them what, what the tillage is and, and what the objectives that we use tillage for when we're looking at soil health and how can we reduce the, the negative effects of tillage on our fields. And that really has opened us up on the whole tillage end to a lot of not only work with the agribusiness but a lot of field days with farmers throughout the last couple of years. Paul and I probably do three to four workshops a week alone this time of year just on tillage and covers and soil health and how they integrate all together. So we, we noticed that tillage was a big issue we had in Michigan. So we look, we're looking at, and we, are, we looked at that time, at different practices on the farm. We also, of course, had to hit cover crops. Both Paul and I are cover crop educators, so we, we can't leave cover crops. Um, this is a graphic that we push a lot. This was done by Dr. Dale Mott, who is now retired um, from MSU Extension, and he call it, we call it the cover crops wheel of life. Uh, and so in our meetings when we talk about soil health with agribusiness, we talk about cover crops. There still is a, a, a lot of agribusiness out there that does not acknowledge the value of cover crops when we look at soil health. So we're working with them a, a lot on how they can integrate cover crops into their plans when they deal with their farmers. Um, and this has been a long process. Right now, uh, Paul and I both will be doing several agribusiness workshops looking at soil health and cover crops. We have been asked to do the winter programming to deal with their dealers and their growers from some of our larger cover crop dealers, seed dealers in the state. So that's been a good avenue for us when we're looking at soil health and cover crops. We also are in, we're looking at compost. Uh, Charles Gould is our compost expert in the state. And he, he was explaining to them what compost is and how it can impact soil health. And he he does very good about telling us what compost is not. One of the things that we've realized as we're going around the state is there is a definition of compost that really is not compost. It's nothing more than glorified manure sitting in a pile. So one of the things we're talking about soil health is we have to explain to them what compost is. And then once, once we do that, then we can talk to them about how compost is going to improve their soil health. And that's been a, a goal of his, and we've taken that as a goal of our group to go around the state and talking about that. Now, those are just kind of the areas that we in Michigan hit hard. Uh, we still are doing it. It is not done, even though this program was, was uh, two years ago, that was our original program. We still are being asked by several agribusiness to come out and do programs on those topics. And pretty much we've grown out and we are doing more topics depending on what they come in. But all of it centers around soil health and ways farmers can improve soil health. Questions? Great, thank you, Christina and Kevin. And we'll go ahead. I think um, if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat box. Why don't we go ahead and do it that way? We've just got a, a couple of minutes that we can take questions for our speakers. OK, well, I have a question for Naeem then. Naeem, you, you gave a a number of the of number of acres uh, uh, in North Dakota that are affected by salinity and sodicity. What percentage of the agricultural acreage in North Dakota is that? Um, I don't have the exact uh, number right now, but there's another study which suggests that about 90 percent of the acres in our state are affected by soil salinity in one way or the other. And having said that, uh, we are not really saying that those acres would be affected totally, but you know, some part of that, those acres would be affected by the salinity where either there would be poor crop or there would be no plant growth at all. Thank you. I was just curious about the extent of the problem, and that helps. And then we've got, from Chris Augustin, we've got an answer there uh, in the chat box, another answer. OK, well, with that, um, thank you uh, for your patience earlier on there in the, uh, in the webinar. I'm glad we got our technology issues resolved. We do go through this with all the presenters ahead of time, and sometimes 
you, you cannot control for everything. You all know that out in the field. I want to call your attention again to the October 15th webinar on aquatic invasive species impacts and resources. And then there are a couple of other uh, sessions coming up after that. Um, you'll ha uh, here in the webinar, you have contact information for each of today's speakers. And I want to thank them all for very interesting information and the great resources that you're providing for us to put up on the website for, for educators and, and others to access. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll wish everyone a good afternoon.